begrüße euch ganz herzlich an diesem schönen Frühjahrsabend ähm, in der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung und ähm, freue mich ganz besonders, dass wir heute Abend Terry Eagleton zur Lecture um, auf, um Kulturkriege haben werden. Ähm, ganz kurz, mein Name ist Christina Keindl, ich bin ähm, Leiterin des Bereichs Strategie und Grundsatzfragen bei der Partei Die Linke und mache nur die Moderation heute Abend. Ja, zum Thema vielleicht nur ganz kurz. Ich werde nicht versuchen, die ausführliche ähm, Vorlesung von Terry Eagleton zusammenzufassen. Das Thema Kulturkriege stellt die Frage nach dem Verhältnis von Kultur und Politik und Imperialismus ähm, im Unterschied zur bürgerlichen oder zum hochkulturellen Verständnis von Kultur, das noch in früheren Zeiten sozusagen Kultur verstanden hat als Kraft der Versöhnung oder als Verkörperung grundlegender Menschen, äh, menschlicher Werte. Ähm, können wir sehen, dass Kultur heute vielfach zum Kampffeld geworden ist und zur Waffe, zum Kriegsgrund. Und die Frage der Universalität von Kultur ist plötzlich sehr eng verknüpft mit Fragen von Geopolitik und von globalen Strategien der Hegemonie. Dabei wird natürlich auch die Frage sein, wie das Feld der Linken oder für linke Politik sich dadurch verschiebt, umgebaut hat. Werden die Kämpfe um Soziale und gegen Ausbeutung und Unterdrückung auf ein neues Terrain gezogen? Oder ist der Terranwechsel selber eine Ausweichbewegung? Das sind nur einige der Fragen, die ähm, Terry Eagleton behandeln wird, äh, denke ich, heute Abend. Ich gl glaube fast gar nicht, dass ich ihn noch näher vorstellen muss, mache das aber trotzdem. Ähm, Terry Eagleton ist der führende Literaturtheoretiker und Literaturkritiker in Großbritannien. Er war Professor in Oxford und Manchester und ist es aktuell noch an der Universität in Lancaster. Sein Werk umfasst über 40 wissenschaftliche Bücher zur Literaturkritik, zur Kulturtheorie, zur Religion, Politik und Geschichte. Mitten in der schwersten Krise des Kapitalismus seit langer Zeit ähm, hat er 2009 äh, mit der These, warum Marx recht hat, ein neues Buch herausgebracht, mit dem er eine Lanze für Marx brach und äh, zentrale Argumente und ideologische Vorurteile gegen den Marxismus zurückgewiesen hat. Ich freue mich sehr, dass er heute Abend hier ist und ähm, möchte euch bitten, ihn ganz herzlich willkommen zu heißen, Terry Eagleton. Wir machen, ähm, es wird jetzt die Vorlesung geben, wir machen danach dann eine Möglichkeit zum Gespräch und zur Diskussion, nur dass ihr Bescheid wisst, dass ihr noch Fragen stellen könnt. Well, it's very nice to be back in Berlin. Last time I was here, I remember, was I was, I was escaping the royal wedding back home. <laughs> William and Kate and all that. But to my dismay, the first sign I saw when I arrived in the airport, just out of the airport, was wedding. A large sign pointing to wedding. And then I read a little further down the road and there was another sign pointing to wedding. And I imagine all these signs were kind of loyally pointing towards Westminster Abbey, you know, this was your way of sharing in the experience uh, over there. Yes. Um, about a year ago, I was shown around what I believe is the largest university in South Asia by its proud president, a man who was flanked by two grim-faced young heavies in black suits um, and shades, and for all I know, concealed Kalashnikovs beneath their jackets. Um, and once the president had finished singing the praises of his sublime business school and magnificent managerial center and transcendentally forward-looking technology studies, I asked him why there seemed to be no critical studies in this otherwise utopian setup. He looked at me as though I'd asked him how many PhDs in pole dancing they awarded each year. You were supposed to laugh at that, but it's early days yet. I'll try and warm you up as I go along. Um, um, and uh, replied in a rather strangulated voice, your point will be noted. He, he then produced a gleaming technological device from his pocket, flipped it open and spoke into it two words in Korean, probably kill him. <laughs> After a while, a car the length of a football pitch arrived, no doubt bulletproofed and probably containing the files of his blood in case some would-be humanistic assassin tried, to, uh, you know, tried to, hit, to kill him. And he was whisked away, wondering, no doubt, why all Englishmen were as stupid as me. It was all a far cry in terms of technology 
from my 30 years in Oxford where typing rather than handwriting a note to one's colleagues was regarded as rather vulgar and the only technology in the college was a, an ingenious little pulley in the senior common room for hoisting the port and Madeira decanters up from the butler's pantry to the dessert table. I doubt that the Korean president would have been much impressed by that. What this incident signifies, I suppose, is that we're currently living through an event as momentous in its own way as the discovery of penicillin or the melting of the polar ice caps, namely the final capitulation of culture and the humanities, and particularly of university education, on a global scale to the priorities of advanced capitalism. Having resisted this development myself for some years, I've now finally decided it's no use fighting it and I want to throw in the towel. It's now my practice, for example, at the beginning of an academic class to uh, ask the students how many of them can afford my 200 euro insights into the subject in hand as opposed to one or two mildly intelligent perceptions costing around a quarter of that price. I then divide the class like an infant school into various sectors depending on their capacity to pay. And um, although I must admit, I mean, this may sound pretty brutal, but the less well, the less affluent students are offered an opportunity to put down a deposit on my brightest ideas and pay the rest off weekly. Uh, or if that proves beyond their capability to perform a few domestic tasks for me in exchange for one or two aperçus about Milton and Proust. As a radical, I've always been concerned to narrow the gap between academia and everyday life and having graduate students iron my socks or take out the garbage in return for a little chat about the heroic couplet strikes me as a very constructive move in this direction. I'd like, although I can't promise, I'd like as far as I can in this talk to avoid the phrase the crisis of culture or the crisis of the humanity, not just because it's something of a cliché, but also because there's a sense in which it's a kind of tautology, rather as the term uh, business ethics is an oxymoron. <laughs> the tautology because there's a sense, isn't there, in which culture or the humanities have always been in crisis. Crisis, in a way, goes right back to their origin. They go together like, you know, Coke and Charlie Sheen. You were supposed to laugh at that too, but it doesn't. You know. um, I mean, it's not as though there was a formation known as culture or the humanities that was in full working order and which was then later blown off course. On the contrary, it was out of a certain historical crisis that the humanities or a specific idea of culture emerged in the first place. As we know them today, the humanities and industrial capitalism were born pretty much at the same time. They were born at a stroke, around the turn of the 18th century, and values which could find no place in this emergent acquisitive order had to take up a home elsewhere, to find some kind of refuge, and as the 19th century drew on, this protected enclave where these values could be nurtured and sustained in relative isolation from the other social institutions, this enclave went under a whole number of names, Geist, the arts, culture, civilization, the humanities, literature, and so on. Because it was structurally distinct from the established order, it was able to act as a powerful critique of it, because there was some daylight now between this strange enclave and the rest of civilization. This enclave, culture or geist or whatever you want to call it, was able to act as a kind of critique. Um, but by the same token, this, by this same distance, generally ensured that the critique was pretty blunted and rather remote and rather ineffectual. It was as though the human body itself, and I mention the body because as I say to my graduate students, um, unless you have the word body in the title of your book these days, it's just not going to get published. I'm sorry about that, it's just the way it is. In my day it was dialectics, you know, but say it's body. Anyway, it was as though the human body itself was split down the middle 
Part of it turned into an efficient instrument, instrument of labor or profit making, a self disciplined instrument, while the and that could only happen by other kinds of energies uh, being, as it were, siphoned off somewhere else. Energies, drives, instincts, values that were dysfunctional for that instrumentalization of the body, spiritual, symbolic, creative, erotic, and so on, uh, had to be siphoned off into some other sphere altogether, whatever name you care to give it, and could always then be nurtured and cultivated behind some kind of cordon sanitaire, which insulated them from the contaminating influences of society at large, but which by the same token, as I say, means that they weren't very effective in their impact on that society. Um, yet another name for this protected enclave, of course, was, has been the university, seen traditionally, classically, as a centre of uh, humane critique. Um, as its name suggests, it was a place which sought to promote some general or universal vision of humanity in a social order that was becoming alarmingly specialised and fragmented. Um, the arts, too, of course, tried to provide that kind of general humane critique, and they could do so for a paradoxical reason, because they, too, had become, as it were, dysfunctional. They'd come loose from a social order in which they had a clear social or political function. They could no longer justify their existence by flattering a, pat a patron or praising a monarch or recounting the heroic history of the tribe, entertaining the court, um, playing their part in the worship of gods, as they did in the days when there were jobs for artists, largely state jobs for them. Um, they could no longer justify their existence in those terms and therefore they had to validate themselves, legitimate their existence in some other kind of way. As the poet William Blake recognised, art had now become part of general commodity production addressed not to God or monarch or nobleman or patron but to any anonymous consumer on the market with the money to buy it and the taste to appreciate it. However, for a certain vein of radical romanticism, in which I think one could place Marx, um, one of the curious strengths of Marx's work, there's a lot of weaknesses about him, one of the curious strengths of his work is that he's, he's an almost unbeatable combination of an Enlightenment rationalist and a romantic humanist, you know, which is hard to beat, really. You know, it's not a, bad, not a bad position. You can retreat from one front to the other, depending on the direction of the attack. You know. Anyway, for a certain vein of radical romanticism, uh, this, uh, this lack of established function for culture, this alienation from other, of culture from other kinds of institutions, was precisely the point. Yes? The whole point of art, you could now claim, if you wanted to be particularly bold-faced about it, the whole point of art was to be gloriously pointless. Yes? In a social order for which, you know, in which a thing had to be useful in order to have value in which the pointless was scandalous and, and useless and hard to place. Or, you know, if that sounds too extravagantly asceticist, um, a new revolutionary function could be plucked from this condition, this dysfunctionality of art, which is, as I say, that of critique. For the first time, really, in history, the arts could be independent enough of the dominant powers to turn on it and hold it to account. And it was the market, of all things, it was the commodification of art, which prized it loose from its traditional social functions, which allowed this to happen. Art had no need any longer to be simply the lackey of power. But this was because it had no proper location anyway within social institutions. So, if you like, a certain virtue could be wrested from the jaws of historical necessity, alienation turned to a constructive end, the disabling distance of dysfunctionality uh, converted into the enabling one of a certain kind of criticism or a certain kind of spiritual transcendence. The work of art could now forge a new destiny for itself in resisting the commodity form. Uh, and the last doomed attempt 
at this freedom and autonomy, this sort of hanging on by one's eyelids, you know, at the eleventh hour, resisting the miseries of commodification in the very forms of art, the last doomed project was, was modernism, which of course happened at roughly the same moment in the early 20th century as culture itself was becoming a full-blown industry. The emergence of modernism and the culture industry, so-called, are pretty well sides of the same coin. Some decades later, in our own time, culture embraced the process of commodification. If you can't beat it, join it became thoroughly and unashamedly locked into the late capitalist order. And since there was now really no daylight between that order and itself, uh, no critical distance either, and therefore momentously the arts abandoned uh, their traditional role of humane critique. And I think it's not accidental, surely, that pretty much at the same historical moment, the universities did much the same. In Britain, as you may know, the state has now stopped funding the humanities, which are thus almost entirely reliant on student fees. And since it's the customers who are now calling the shots, you can guarantee that every English course in every university from now on will be about vampires. <laughs> this is particularly scandalous in a country which has always rightly rejected the appalling idea that education should be a commodity, a view which is alive and well, of course, in the United States. There are one, there are one or two private universities in Britain, but um, nobody knows where they are. Their addresses are kept very secret. Well, you know, it's impossible to find them, actually, you know, let alone study there. Um, it was the state that footed the bill for my own education at Cambridge many years ago, for which I didn't pay a bean. Admittedly, that was in the period before the Industrial Revolution, where only a tiny elite of people attended university. But the same, of course, could easily be done today. Most British students seem to believe, quite, I don't know about German students, quite properly, that it's the community's moral duty to educate the young, not, not to treat it like selling an insurance policy. If we in Britain could lay our hands on the untold billions stole, stolen from the people in tax avoidance and tax evasion, we go some considerable way, I think, towards financing free higher education. And if that wasn't enough, then we could always take the banks into public ownership and rehire their chief executives after a lengthy period of fasting, penance, and public self-flagellation as doormen and lavatory cleaners. Now we move the discussion to an altogether more sublime and noble note. So there's a kind of shift here you may detect in the whole discourse. There's a small class of exceedingly rare objects which are, as the jargon has them, autotelic, is to say, which have their ends in themselves. Very unusual phenomena. The mightiest of these, of course, is God, who is his own ground, reason, end, and origin. Yes. God is entirely pointless. That is the most common ground between good old 19th century rationalists like Richard Dawkins and theologians. Dawkins doesn't know that, but actually when he says that God is completely pointless and futile, he doesn't realize that's a very orthodox and traditional theological view of God. Um, which is just to say that like a joke or a love lyric, God is his own point. Another, a second of these mysteriously autotelic phenomena is evil, which seems enigmatic and mysterious and opaque, not because, because it's not about being very, very wicked, you know, really, really wicked, you know, unbelievably wicked. It's because it's that special and extremely rare form of wickedness which is the obscenely pleasurable orgy of destruction entirely for its own sake, with no utilitarian or obvious purpose in view. Evil, which, as with the Holocaust, might even be counterproductive if one's thinking of it in, in utilitarian terms. There is, in fact, a remarkably cheap and extraordinarily readable and attractive book on this topic called On Evil, uh, written by um, myself, like um, <laughs> most attractive and extremely cheap and remarkable books. Uh, to say that, you know, 
to say that God created the world, I mean, whether you believe in that or not, it's not the point. It's just that, you know, to understand the meaning of that phrase theologically, to say that God created the world isn't a statement, of course, about how the world got started, as old-fashioned 19th century rationalists like Richard Dawkins think. It has nothing whatsoever to do with that. The greatest of all theologians, I suppose, Thomas Aquinas, thought it quite conceivable that the universe had no origin at all, as indeed did his great mentor, Aristotle. Aquinas did, in fact, believe uh, that the universe had an origin, uh, but he didn't think, think that had anything to do with the doctrine of creation. The doctrine of creation has nothing whatsoever to do with big bangs or cosmic soups, um, uh, all of which is properly atheistic stuff. Um, if you want to know what the doctrine of creation actually is about, then if you just approach me privately after this lecture for a very modest fee, I'll let you know. Okay. In the meanwhile, I'll just throw out a few tantalizing hints you know, to whet your appetite over this. Among other things, it has to do with the fact that the world, being God's, shares in his own autotelic nature, that's to say, exists purely for the hell of it, to use a technical theological Huh. Um, atheists and believer, as I say, are entirely at one in their belief that the world isn't for anything at all. Like God, it exists entirely for its own self-delight, though you wouldn't believe so if you're reading the newspapers. And it thus resembles the work of art far more than it does some cunning piece of industrial manufacture. Yes, God is an artist, not a manufacturer. In other words, the doctrine of creation, theologically speaking, is the final refutation of an instrumental rationality. If you want a refutation of an instrumental rationality, look at the world itself. Like a work of art, theologically speaking, it's entirely gratuitous, grace-like. There's absolutely no need for the cosmos at all. The doctrine of creation rather like modernism, involves the mind-bending insight that there's no need for anything whatsoever, and certainly not for Tom Cruise or Sarah Palin. Um, uh, human beings, then, on this view, on the view of what you might call the politics of creation, are at their finest when they're gloriously pointless, just like works of art. That's one reason, of course, why the work of art from about the mid-18th century onwards, here in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, became so vital, you know, every major philosophy returns to the question of aesthetics. Why so? In a period where, as Marx points out, certain kinds of production, namely intellectual and artistic production, are less and less valued by the bourgeoisie. Why is it that in the very period of bourgeois philistinism, aesthetics is born, this new, strange, upstart, hybrid discourse known as aesthetics, and is repeated again and again, certainly in this country, by every philosopher? Well, I suppose you might say, because partly it's not really about art. Aesthetics, of course, didn't begin as being about art. The word aesthetics, of course, comes from the Greek word for perception uh, and, and sensation, aesthetics begins, and here I, you know, this is the kind of sentence I advise my postgraduate students to use, it begins as a discourse of the body. Yes, write that down, because you might need it, you know. For, yeah. um, it doesn't begin as being about art at all, and the reasons why the artifact in this newly defined way is so important for politics and philosophy and so on, are a number of reasons, but one of them is its sheer gratuitousness. It seems to offer a kind of view of a self-generating, self-founding, self-grounding phenomenon, which perhaps is a privileged utopian glimpse of how we might be too, <coughs> of how when, men and women might be under changed political conditions. And that's, I think, is part of what the radical romantic tradition is trying to say, that we have no more, uh, human beings have no, have, because they are created in the theological sense, they have no more need than their creator does to justify their existence before some grim-faced tribunal of geist or utility or production or history or telos or whatever it is. They exist, as I say, to use this esoteric theological term just for the hell of it. Or at least they should do. 
the moment, of course, the vast majority of men and women on the planet, like the vast majority of men and women who have ever lived and died, exists for the power and profit of a few. Indeed, uh, your, your very own Schopenhauer, you know, a philosopher so consistently and unremittingly gloomy that he's unwittingly hilarious, and what it is about sort of total gloom, which is funny, but he is quite, without meaning to be, of course, thought that anybody who thought that humanity had been worth it, you know, that the, as they say in English, the kicks outweigh, the, the hapence outweigh the kicks, uh, thought that anybody who thought that the wretched history of misery and suffering and degradation, which was humanity, could be justified by anything that humanity itself could produce, uh, Schopenhauer thought that that was utterly ridiculous. A question for Marxists there, of course, very, rare, very rarely raised by Marxists, even if history struggles through to a good socialist end, would that justify the amount of suffering and injustice and misery and unhappiness that is the tale of class society? A tale which to some extent goes into the very making of socialism as far as Marx is concerned. Yes? Um, for the radical romantic heritage, I think that's the, the, what that's really trying to say, I suppose, is a society has to be created in which, as far as feasible, men and women could realise what Marx keeps calling their powers and capacities uh, purely for their own self-delight and for the welfare of others rather than for the power and profit of a few. Um, Marxism, of course, is all about leisure and not labor. Whenever I say that in the United States, they don't, they all look very blank and uncomprehending. And I always think, oh, that's because, you know, they get up at 5.30 in the morning and have three showers, you know, and then run 10 miles to work for the next 15 hours. So it's something about labor. No, it's because, of course, they say leisure, not le leisure. You see, it's a, um, uh, I mean, the only, the only, clearly, the only good reason for being a Marxist, apart from you know, annoying people you don't like and so on, you know, is because you don't like having to work. You know, if there's any, anybody here who doesn't like having to work, then just sign on. You know. um, suitably reorganized, so Marx considered the fabulous wealth accumulated, so such, you know, such a kind-hearted spirit by capitalism, could be deployed, redeployed, so that men and women could, as far as feasible, be released from the indignities of degrading toil. And at that point, of course, for Marx, authentic human history could begin. It hadn't even started yet. All we'd had so far was one more dreary variation on the same tune of exploitation, one new kind of exploitative mode of production after another, and what, when history did get started, of course, for Marx, it couldn't be pre-drafted because you can't pre-draft freedom. Marx is a prophet, not in the sense of a clairvoyant peering into the future. The Old Testament prophets were not clairvoyants who tried to peer into the future. They have nothing to do with clairvoyance. Fortune hunting, you know, gazing into the crystal ball, is what the given system uses to you know, ask its economists whether their profits will be safe for the next 30 years. Profit has nothing to do with that. The prophet in the Bible is the one who, who warns us that unless we seek to change our ways and seek justice, then there won't be a future, or at least it's going to be pretty unpleasant. Um, Oscar Wilde shared this vision. Um, people forget, of course, that Oscar Wilde wrote a magnificent pamphlet, The Soul of Man Under Socialism, that was very influential in the British labour movement. And it's not at all accidental that Wilde was both an aesthete and a socialist. In both ways, he believed that, as it were, production for its own self-delight, whether of art or of life, was the right kind of moral and political goal. Wilde wanted socialism just so that we could then you know, just sort of sit around the place in loose crimson garments in various interesting postures of jouissance, reciting Homer to each other, sipping absinthe, and that would just be the working day. You know, I won't begin to describe, you know, the leisure activities. Um, 
when Marx comes to consider the question of production, he doesn't think about cotton mills and, and coal mines. He thinks about the work of art. The work of art for Marx is paradigmatic of production under, non, under emancipated or non-exploitative conditions. So that for this radical romantic lineage, as far as culture goes, there's no need to justify the existence of culture or the humanities any more than there is a need to justify a smile or a sob. Some leftists are a little uneasy, however, with this view because they think it's rather a, a patrician view, yes, an aristocratic view, which in a sense it is. Doesn't it smack a bit too much of hoisting those Madeira bottles up from the butler's pantry to the dessert table? Um, well, think again of Wilde, who was the perfect English gentleman in a way that only one who wasn't English certainly wasn't perfect and was only dubiously a gentleman, could be. What Wilde saw was that a certain aristocratic notion of culture which he himself lived could be recycled more universally, more progressively, on the back of an accumulated uh, wealth, that the leisure of the privileged class could be read perversely, proleptically, uh, of a future in which the great majority of men and women could also be free of the exigencies of hard, of hard labour. If the humanities are in trouble, however, it's not only because of the philistinism of our rulers. It's, it, there are certain, of course, seismic upheavals within them themselves, which... Uh, uh, chairperson touched on this when she began her introduction, uh, which one might summarise as the fact that in our time, culture has passed over from being part of the solution to being part of the problem. Um, it thus has a remote resemblance to Karl Krauss's uh, view of psychoanalysis as, you know, memorably part of the problem to which it posed as a solution. What I mean by that is that in 19th century Europe, Culture or the humanities could be seen as an answer to political conflict, social tensions of various kinds. They stood for what it meant to be human at a level which was thought to cut beneath our relatively superficial differences and conflicts. And if the arts were important, it wasn't because they were so important to themselves, it was largely because they concretized that very fundamental consensus. In itself, that consensus is of, is of the values that the ground on which men and women, despite their individual differences, can come together. That consensus is so deep and abstract that it needs some tangible incarnation. Uh, it needs to be invested with a sensuous body, and the answer to that is art. Yes, the arts were, among other things, a wonderfully, as it were, portable way of carrying these values around with one and communicating them to others. If, if, for example, you wanted your colonial subject to know what it meant to be civilized, then you didn't need to you know, subject them to a lot of boring lectures. You just handed them a volume of Shakespeare. Yes? And the consensus there, as it were, kicked in. Um, there, there is, of course, we're very aware today of everything that's wrong with that model in, in its essential ignoring or suspending of what makes people different. We forget, however, don't we, uh, what the Marxist tradition has always insisted on, the enormous revolutionary power of that abstract bourgeois universalism. Yeah. Marxism has always distinguished itself from, say, postmodernism in approaching that phenomenon dialectically, seeing both sides. If indeed it resulted in riding roughshod over individual forms of identity, it also meant now momentously that for the first time anybody could be in on the political game simply by virtue of their shared humanity, simply by virtue of being a belonging to a particular kind of species, Marx's Gattungswesen, simply by that, by virtue of that, you had the right to share in the discourse, not because you were the daughter of an Austrian count or the son of a Prussian uh, aristocrat, but simply on those grounds. An enormously revolutionary insight, which of course also involved an enormous abstraction from and suspension of the specificity of individual identity. I think one of the achievements of Marx 
is that he actually manages to cling, because, partly because he's an Enlightenment rationalist and a Romantic humanist, he clings on to what's virtuous about universalism, but he insists that it has to be concretely and individually instantiated. And that, if you like, is the Romantic humanist bit of Marx. Um, however, one of the problems with this generous-hearted but hopelessly idealist version of culture was that it could, as I say, survive only really by suspending individual differences, and it was these that then gradually came to the fore as the 20th century wore on. The single most supremely successful radical movement of the late modern age, revolutionary nationalism, which transformed the face of the globe in a handful of decades, particularly in the in the mid, early and mid 20th century. Uh, the culture, culture for revolutionary nationalism, far from being a solution to political struggle, was the very language in which it was articulated. Culture in the broad anthropological sense of language, kinship, identity, history, heritage, symbol, custom, and the rest. That now was the very medium in which political demands were shaped and articulated. Um, and the same was to be true in a more minor key, perhaps, of the various forms of so-called identity politics which followed in the wake of the end of that great current of revolutionary nationalism. It's roughly when that ends, let's say the early 1970s, that so-called identity politics begin to get off the ground. So culture was now itself astonishingly, for some classical views of it, was itself a, a, an arena of contention, uh, which was hardly the case for Diderot or Schiller or Matthew Arnold or the early Thomas Mann. Um, uh, from the standpoint of a more traditional liberal humanist conception of culture, the phrase cultural politics, again, is almost an oxymoron, you know, like uh, Texan haute cuisine, or, you know, Mormon intellectual, for example. Um, uh, since, I mean, cu culture and the humanities had in part constituted themselves by disowning and suppressing what they saw as the degraded domain of the political, which now was to return in the 20th century, in the mid-20th century, with a vengeance. Culture was now summarily defined. Culture was now, is now, what people were prepared to kill for or die for. Huh? Nobody has ever been prepared to kill for Balzac or Berlioz or Beethoven, except perhaps for a few seriously weird people hiding out in caves somewhere to ashamed to come out and uh, explain themselves to the rest of us. Uh, and that then spelt the demise of a particular ideology of humanities or of culture which had served the bourgeoisie extraordinarily well in its time, yes? One knows, of course, the difference between a Marxist and a postmodernist by the fact that the former has lavish praise for capitalism and the revolutionary role of the bourgeoisie, whereas the postmodernist just thinks those things are bad, like smoking, <laughs> salt, you know, things like that. Um, that, once had the demise of that, uh, in its day, tremendously effective middle-class revolutionary ideology, which uh, we've yet really to replace with something else, I think. It certainly can't be replaced simply by uh, a mere celebration of difference, you know, to lurch from a too abstract universalism to a too myopic particularism, which has been part of the story of our times. Perhaps the essential movement, or part of the essential move, is one from seeing our common humanity as a given which was part of that great liberal humanist tradition, to seeing it as something which is still to be politically accomplished, as a project, rather than a given. Perhaps one should respond to the phrase common humanity in the way that uh, Gandhi famously did when asked what he thought about British civilization and replied that he thought it would be a very good idea. <laughs> it was something to be done not something given. And to do that, I think, would mean, among other things, re trying to reach beyond a cultural humanism, which, for all its extraordinary, its magnificent achievements, 
Just think of the magnificent artistic heritage of the progressive bourgeoisie. But for all that, has been both hubristic and narcissistic, self-admiring, yes? Um, it means, for example, I think, accepting... Um, there's always a, a, a kind of satirical or debunking impulse in materialism, as Marx saw about Diderot, um, bringing that down to earth. Yes, Nietzsche does this, of course, in his very different materialist fashion when it comes to rather highfalutin forms of cultural idealism. It means, for example, accepting in the first place that hum humanity uh, is an animal, that whatever else we are, whatever more glamorous and sexy things we can get up to, we're in the first place natural material objects. You know, if you say that in certain places in California, they, they shoot at you. you know? um, man, comments the philosopher Alexander Kurjev, the great Hegelian, philosopher, that man is, is a fatal disease of the animal. For Thomas Aquinas, um, and from here on I get very, very religious. So, sorry about this, but that's, I'm just getting old, you know. And, you know people do when they get old, you know. Have a crucifix and uh, somewhere. Um, for Aquinas, who in his own way is a thorough going materialist, um, human rationality is always an animal rationality. Yeah? We think as we do, Aquinas thinks, and we feel as we do, roughly because of the kind of bodies we have. Uh, if a lion could speak, Wittgenstein famously remarks, we would not be able to understand what he said. Why not? Couldn't we get some kind of simultaneous translation, you know, as we're having at the moment? No. His, his body, and therefore his material form of life, is just too different from us. Yeah. Uh, and Aquinas might have said the same of an angel. If an angel could speak, we would not be able to understand what he said. Um, culture, language, signification are deeply embedded in practical material forms of life. As Wittgenstein says in Uncertainty, it is what we do that lies at the bottom of our language games. A far more complex, of course, insight than it sounds. Um, Aquinas would have believed in the disembodied soul of Michael Jackson, but he wouldn't have believed that it was Michael Jackson. When Kochev says man is a disease of the animal, he means partly, of course, doesn't he, that humanity is that curious creature that has established, constituted itself on the basis of a distancing of and disavowal of its own animality. And the humanities have traditionally reflected something of the spiritual supremacism. For Christian theology, by contrast, history turns on the animality of God, otherwise known as Jesus the other great defect, I think, of this, of this version of culture, the version of the human, is that it's not really tragic enough. That may sound a strange, a kind of perverse, a masochistic thing to say. Do we really want you know, visions of humanity to be more tragic? Um, when, when I was at Cambridge, a student at Cambridge, an English student at Cambridge years ago, I, we, I sat a paper called Tragedy, which all English students at Cambridge sit, and a friend of mine, as we were walking out of the paper, remarked, apropos of questions such as, you know, Arthur Miller is a fine craftsman, but his work doesn't really aspire to the status of tragedy. She remarked that the examiners seemed to think that tragedy was a good thing. <laughs> and there is, of course, much in the, theory, the, the tradition of tragic theory, not least here in Germany, which does, of course, overwhelmingly see tragedy as affirmative and so on, and doesn't really look at the sheer misery involved in it. That's not what I mean when I say that this version of the humanities isn't a sufficiently tragic one. I mean that like, like the United States, which is a compulsively affirmative, sort of bright-eyed, square-jawed kind of nation, which tends to sweep failure and loss and breakdown and death under the carpet, yes, um, it fails to recognize the tragic insight that the human can only be built and only endures on the basis of a recognition of the inhuman, only through a solidarity with failure uh, and the disfiguring of humanity, of which, of course, the great symbol is the Holocaust, only through a solidarity with that failure and breakdown in the tragic, in the radical tragic tradition, is any authentic humanity possible, as I think uh, Samuel Beckett very well understood. <coughs> 
um, uh, the, uh, I was introduced to somebody coming from Great Britain, but I am, of course, Irish and I live in Ireland. And when Beckett, the great Irish writer, was once asked by a rather dim-witted Parisian journalist whether he was English, he replied, au contraire. <laughs> For Christianity, the key signifier of human history is the tortured body of a suspected political criminal, the Romans, of course, reserved crucifixion only for political rebels or those they suspected or pretended to suspect, perhaps, of political rebellion. Um, one who spoke out for justice, whose mission seemed to have disastrously collapsed around his ears and who was done to death by the state for his pains and who warned his comrades that if they were to be true to him, that the same thing would happen to them. There's, there's, your, uh, there's your opium of the people for you. There's your pie in the sky, yes. Uh, as a friend of mine summarized the message of the New Testament, if you don't love, you're dead, and if you do, they'll kill you. <laughs> Very consoling, isn't it, religion, I always think, yeah. Only by trying to stare the gorgon's head of the real in the eyes without being turned to stone by is it, as tragedy does try, with varying degrees of success, could there be any conceivable hope of new life, of resurrection? Only if this frightful trauma is acknowledged as the last word, might it just turn out not to be, but with no guarantees. I think there's an authentic tradition of tragedy revolving around that kind of insight. Otherwise, of course, you simply buy your affirmation on the cheap. If Jesus had thought to himself, well, you know, only a few hours on the cross and then three days in the tomb and then, you know, an eternity of bliss, yeah, pretty good deal, that. I think I'll sign on for that, you know. He would, of course, never have been raised from the dead in theological terms. Um, it's because it's only by living that death to the full, not only in all of its agony, but in all of its absurdity, you know, why is this ridiculous thing happening anyway, um, it's only by going through that radical self-dispossession that one could emerge somewhere on the other side. And that kind of tragic insight is very typical of the early Marx, very typical of what he says about the loss of humanity as being the ground for the gain of humanity, for example, in the disgracefully precocious economic and philosophical manuscripts. Um, tragedies don't have to end badly. I mean, the Oresteia doesn't end badly. Many a tragedy doesn't end badly. Tragedy means simply that you have to be hauled through hell if you're to achieve any degree of redemption. Uh, such is the crookedness of humanity, of human history, of class history, that only by virtue of a radical breaking and remaking could anything be possible. And the fact that that is the case is itself tragic. Would that it were not. You know, would that our condition were not such that such a traumatic upheaval, a tragic upheaval, were required to repair it? It would be a lot better if it wasn't. I think that Marxism, Christianity and psychoanalysis are all in their very different registers agreed on that notion of tragedy. That has not by and large been the conventional liberal humanist understanding. Uh, this vision is far too bleak and, 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 in a sense, extremist and uncongenial and uncomfortable for that. Uh, the humanities have not, as we know, on the whole, or culture has not on the whole rushed to acknowledge the fact that their obscene underside has been violence, misery and exploitation. Uh, Nietzsche and Marx, in their very different ways, both believed that it's just that Nietzsche rejoiced in it and Marx didn't. For every cathedral, a pit of bones. For every great 19th century poet, the maidservant who warmed his bath water. A humanities, an idea of culture that could confront that unpalatable truth, that could confront the grim materialist subtext of culture, as it were, and reconstitu reconstitute themselves in the light of it. Now, that really would, I think, be worth fighting for. But first of all, as a necessary condition of that, we have to stretch that Korean president on the ground and run over him with his own limousine. 